Hello, um, I'm Oz for Extra Sleepers. Um, I could talk about any number of things. I guess what I, by default, I talk about interfacing computers with modular synths, if that's what anybody's interested in. Otherwise, I can talk about other things. But um, shall I start there? Is that yes, what everybody's come yeah, to here? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what I'll do then um, is I guess I'll. The, the most logical way for me to do this sometimes is to basically take you on my personal journey with how these things were developed because it, th that goes from quite a simple beginning to what is potentially quite an elaborate system currently. Um, but basically this all started for me um, quite a while ago now, 12 years maybe, um, at a time when I, I had no pretensions to be a hardware maker at all, I was just making plugins. Um, and the idea was kind of floating around um, in, the, in the synthesizer space of using, obviously using control voltages to control things, but using um, control voltages generated by audio hardware to control things. This kind of idea was out there, and I thought being um, a vaguely established plugin maker, I'd have a go at writing a plugin that did that, which I did, and that thing was called Silent Way, um, which worked. Um, and when I first developed that, I was using this um, as my audio interface. This is a Motu Ultralight Mark III. Um, now, the joy of using, I said, the, the joy of an Ultralight versus any other in audio interface, say, or the joy of Motu ones in particular, is that they are what's known as DC coupled, which means you can basically use their outputs as CVs directly. Um, so just with your audio interface, uh, and a cable. Obviously they've got quarter inch outputs on the back of there and you want 3.5 millimeter things to plug in here. By the way, that is a 3.5 millimeter cable. There's no such thing as an eighth inch cable. That is one of my pet hates. It's not an eighth of an inch. That is 3.5 millimeters. Um, and the other slight subtlety about it, if you're going to use the outputs of an audio interface directly, is that you want a cable that doesn't connect the ring um, because of technical reasons. This is kind of Motu's own advice when they were talking about this themselves. I have a cable that just has the tip and the shield connected to the tip and the shield to this, which is this is a cable that I happen to make and sell. Or just buy a cable and cut the ring off or use a Y cable and just use the tip end of it. But that's kind of detail which you can go away and look up. But basically I'll show you what you can do. You can just plug that into there and then you can plug that into your VCO and then let me just unpatch all the stuff that's going to make that sound like anything other than that is. So if we're lucky, right let's, no, let's get rid of that, where's that coming from, we don't want that gate. Okay, so that's just the VCO, right? And you take your CV, you can plug it in there, and then by sending audio out of the interface using a plugin, which is what I wrote. Let's put that one on there. No, not that one. That one. wiggle a knob in your plug-in and you can control the pitch of your VCO. Just turn the filter up. So basically, from here on in, everything is possible. You've got software that controls the hardware. All you've got to now is do now is write the right hard software. Um, so that's great. The thing that was in the first version of Silent Way that makes this kind of useful in a musical context rather than an abstract context is that you really want to be able to control that in a, a kind of quantized pitched way so you can play tunes because a lot of people like to play tunes or sequence tunes um, and the thing you need for that is you need to know the software needs to know what level to send out to get the right voltage out of here to make the right pitch here because of course this not being designed for CV control isn't nicely calibrated so you know exactly where an octave is or anything like that so the Vaguely clever bit of Silent Way is in this plugin, which is called the Voice Controller. And all you do is you 
take another output of your VCO or the output that you're using in the first place and you plug it back into here into an input so basically now the plug-in can listen to the synth and then you press this button marked calibrate and what that done then basically the plug-in runs through a series of fairly arbitrarily chosen voltages, listens to what it gets back and then figures out the relationship between numbers and software and pitch. So when they look that will work. Okay, so that seemed to work. So now, um, just using my, just using the built-in keyboard in live, you can play a tune. So that's basically that plus everything else and you can make all music um, because you can now control the pitch um, <coughs> from software. Now I don't want to go on a huge sales pitch for Silent Way um, as software. It's there, it does that, it does a lot of other things as well. Um, I could show you some of them. Um, so other things that you might like, you might <coughs> like to have a gate at this point, I'm going to run out of cables. I'll show you that when I, I'm not using this because I've only got a couple of these uh, quarter inches for 3.5 millimeter cables. Do you know if other sound interfaces would do the same? Um, there's a partial list on my website. Um, basically, it's most of the Motus, more recently, the more recent PreSonus ones, and I think some of the Apollos, actually. But um, yeah. Did they DC couple them for this reason, or is this a byproduct of why? I, I think that's a byproduct of some decision that Motu made a long time ago okay. for audio reasons and right. have stuck with, um, but not working at Motu, I can no, tell no, you no. definitively. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's just, so I'll, I'll kind of grant, we'll come back to more of Silent Way when I've gone through a few more of these permutations. So, I guess the reason I got into the hardware originally is, is this is great if you happen to have a DC coupled interface like a Motu, what if you don't? Um, so this, let me just do some jiggling of hardware. This one here <coughs> is an RME UCX and this is most definitely not DC coupled. So the instructive thing at this point is to show you what happens if you use an audio interface that is not DC coupled and you try and do the same thing. So let's put it back in there and um, let's turn that up. So uh, this is my VCO pitch. So now I'm going to plug that into the back of the UCX here. If I can find the right one. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm just going to wiggle this knob. You can hear it, right? It, it, it kind of does it, but it... <laughs> it sounds like a very slowly dying cat. Because it's trying to send the DC voltage that you need to sustain the pitch. But then, because it's AC coupled, there's a big capacitor on the output, basically. It's always drooping very, back, very slowly back towards zero. So you can, you, know, you can get away with that for an LFO, maybe, but you can't use that for pitch. So... I guess that the first hardware thing that Expert Sleepers made was a thing called the ES1, which um, was a solution for sending CVs through AC coupled hardware. Now I don't have one of those to show you because that was superseded a couple of years after by the thing I made um, called the ES3, which bypassed the analog connectivity completely and used the digital output from the order interface. Um, and brought that into the Eurorack. So I have, a, this is an ES3 Mark IV now, it's fourth iteration of the hardware. So basically, what the UCX has, which a lot of audio interfaces do, is it has an ADAP output, optical cable, which carries eight channels of audio. And you can just pop that in to the ES3 and it gives you eight channels of audio into the modular. Um, the difference, I mean, Fundamentally, this is an audio interface. It's like, say, like the um, bearing a 88-8200 thing. It's just taking the ADAT and converting it to audio, but the outputs are DC coupled, so you can use them for CVs, 
and it's got a wide voltage range. Um, it, it covers the whole voltage range that you can get in a Eurorack, which most things don't. So like this one, the ultralight say is about plus or minus four volts, which, you know, it's, it's eight octaves if you use that to play a tune, but it's not gonna open some of your envelopes all the way or sweep a LFO widely, whereas this, the AS3 does a full plus or minus 10 volts. Um, and I, I won't cover it here, but um, I have an equivalent kind of parallel range of things which uses SPDIF as the connectivity rather than ADAT. But ADAT's easier because it's got a lot more channels to play with and it's much more plug and play. So with ES3, if you happen to have an ADAT output, you can basically do exactly the same thing and you can take your pitch, but now we can forget about these odd cables and we can just take a patch cable and find one that's long enough out of the S3, put it in there, and then we have to remember what output we were using. Uh, there we go. So now. And you can hear the range that I'm sweeping over is much wider now because it's covering a bigger range of the values. So. Now, now we're in control, we can send CVs out um, using the voice controller, as I've mentioned, you can, you can see conceptual tunes that will genu generate a gate as well, um, and envelopes, um, other elements of, well, let's actually patch that in, why not? Um, so, Of course I haven't calibrated it, that's why it sounds weird. Should we recalibrate? I think going for two calibrations in one session is... Uh, hang on, what have I got plugged in now? Oh, if it's in that, right, so... Of course I have to plug it into the input of this thing as well, if I want to be able to hear it. Right, let's see what happens now. You get the idea, you can write your MIDI roll in live and you can now sequence up your, your modular. Um, I guess at this point maybe we we'll, should take a step back to say, well, why are we even bothering with this, right? Why are we using an audio interface to control hardware? Maybe should have mentioned that a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, I guess the, there, are, there are a number of reasons. The number one reason for some people would be that this offers sample accurate time, okay? Because your CV is being generated by hardware, by audio hardware, your CV is by definition in time with your audio because it's part of your audio system. There's, there's no separation of audio and MIDI and MIDI to CV converters and blah, blah, blah. Everything is just a signal. As far as live's concerned, it's all just sound. Some of them happen to represent slow moving sounds, which are pitches, or very sudden sounds, which are gates, but it's all just audio. So if you play your audio in there and you play your CV back or make your CVs in plugins, because it's all part of one system, it's all in time. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, computers are very flexible. Um, you can program them to do a lot of different things and anything that you can think of to generate a CV, you can now do in software. You don't have to build a, a circuit to do it. So you can use plugin, you can use Max MSP, you can use Reactor, you can use PD, you can use all kinds of stuff. And the, I guess the reason I don't bang on about SilentWay as much as I used to is because there are a lot of people focused on the software now, as I personally am a little bit more focused on the hardware. Um, even like Bitwig Studio now, it's got CV stuff in it. Um, 
lots of people doing uh, CV Toolkit is another one, Audulous is another one, all these software developers thinking of interesting ways to integrate these two worlds. And it, it's not just about CVs either, because even with the Motu or with the S3 or the S8, which I'll come to in a minute, because it, everything is interchangeably audio or CV, you can just use this thing to put audio <coughs> through your system as well, right? If I, I mean, those are the two outputs I've used there to generate my CV and gain to play that. If, if I would instead rather use those outputs to play a drum loop, uh, if I had a drum loop a minute ago, there it is. So that's because I haven't repatched it yet, but that's basically just sending the Amen breakout and using it as a CV. But if I actually take that, um, where is it going? No, wrong one. There we go. So now the same output that a minute ago was a CV is now a 24-bit. 44.1 kilohertz audio output, and I can just mangle up that. And then maybe now is the time to throw in some other things Silent Way does. For example, if I want an LFO on that, Silent Way LFO. Uh, let's get this cable. Not that cable, because that for some reason was doing something I needed. What was that doing? Oh, right, okay. No, not, not playing today. It's the trouble with having all my cables the same colour. <laughs> there we go, right. Okay, so that's a software LFO. Maybe it could be better, but it's a software LFO. If I want it to be tempo synced, I just just choose the tempo sync button. There you go. So there's advantages to doing things in software apart from precision and timing. It's just sheer convenience. It's in the door, it knows the tempo. You can do things like tempo sync your LFOs. Um, and it's, you know, that's, it's a plugin, right? If you want two plugins, you don't have to pay for another plugin. You just hit command D and live and suddenly you've got two LFOs mm -hmm. rather than dropping another hundred dollars mm -hmm. on another LFO. <clears throat> so I mean I, I mentioned this especially for people who are thinking of getting going in, in modular. You can hear an analog VCO, you can hear an analog filter, you maybe can't hear an analog LFO unless you have a reason that you actually know you want an analog LFO. You know there's a reason the Profit Rev 2 has digital bits in it, right? I'm not, that's right, I think yeah. that's right. You know, the analog polysynths often have digitally generated LFOs because you fundamentally don't really notice very much. Or certainly if you just want to get a few modules, get a nice filter, get a nice VCO, but leave some things in software until you know why you need it in hardware. Um, if you just want something that wiggles about up and down very slowly, software will do that for you. Um, so it's a, it's a money saver, basically. Um, as well as being tremendously convenient. Um, what else? So there's other bits of Silent Way LFO. There's like a step sequence plug plugin. Um, sorry, that's my phone quacking. Turn that off. Um, other bits and bobs. But yeah, I, I've shown you the kind of core elements of that. So that's the that's the S3. That's the ADAT thing. Now next to the uh, I'm going to kind of build up to ditching the computer in a minute. Um, next to the S3, there's, there's kind of two directions away from it, but let's do this direction away from it first. This one next to it is the S6, is, which is the kind of reverse thing in that it has CV slash audio inputs and an ADA output. And this lets you take signals the other way, back into the computer. So that can either be... <coughs> that can either be audio, and then you've got a very convenient pipe for eight audio signals to multi-track into your door, which is handy, or it can be CVs. 
Now this is where it is kind of the only game in town. Whereas there are there are oh, that's not work, is it? sorry this thing's got a broken aid up port. Um, whereas there are audio interfaces with DC coupled outputs like the Motu, like I've mentioned, there are no audio interfaces with DC coupled inputs. They just aren't there. Whereas the ES6 is one of those. So, like I say, you can bring your audio through, which is very handy, or you can actually bring a CB through. Um, now, at this point, I usually have to think carefully about exactly what I'm going to try and demo. Um, let me just see if it's even working. It was earlier. Um, now would be a good time to shout out any questions you might have <laughs> while I just think about getting this sorted out. So with the idea of recording in DC coupled information, yes. that would say allow you to record complex modulation yes. and then loop that and possibly send it to multiple outputs yes. or even during different projects. That was what I was about to do. You've completely stolen my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's, let's just set something up that basically does that. Something similar. Um, okay. Um, what I would like at this point is okay. Well, well I've got a I've got a little analog step sequencer here, right? Uh, it's a Dale Tirana. So what I'll do is I'll take my my CV uh, and my group. Do I want, no, I wouldn't take the gate, I'll just take the CV and I'll turn that up and then, ooh, not that one. Sorry, this is the, the curse of trying to demonstrate more than one thing in one session. Okay, that's what I want, except what I want to do is I want to take that into there and then I want to take that one into here. Okay, so, so this is my sequencer, right? The module. Um, but that's coming through the computer. And if I find a oscilloscope, plug it those that are anywhere near the computer can see that's my sequence. So as far as the computer's concerned, don't forget, that's just audio, but we happen to know it's CV. But because it's audio in the computer, we can now record it. Apparently I have that running still, who knew? Let's just get rid of that. Okay. So in live now, it's just recording an audio clip as far as life's concerned, but we know it's a CV and we can dick about with that. Okay. And now, I quite like that thing where I twiddle the knob, so I can just go back and loop that bit now. Slow it down. So that's live replaying the CV that I improvised. But it's just the pitch CV, right? If I want to change the oscillator, I can just take a different output, change the output. So it, all I've recorded is the pitch CV and everything else is still completely live in the modular. It's a very simple example, but it gives you an idea how the two are becoming like one big system, really. And if you think about something like Max MSP, which is all about like virtual patching, if you can have patching from the computer to here and patching from the computer back in and everything is just the signal or audio or whatever, it all becomes one big unified system, which has a lot of potential um, and is a lot of fun. So I'm going to take a swig of beer because I'm dry. Um, mm. Okay, was that everybody clear on what I did there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's maybe not an obvious step. Can you just explain how that was routed? Yeah, so um, the 
So it's the, the, the analog sequencer output into the ES6. The ES6 is coming into this track in live and then straight back out through the ES3. And then the ES3 is going into the pitch. So it, to kind of think of it, well, it's exactly that really. So it, when, when live is in monitoring mode, when live is just monitoring the signal, then this is live. But if I just start playing the recorded clip instead, then I've got the clip that I have. It's now just exactly the same as if you're playing a guitar into it and monitoring it through some effects and you're listening to it live, but if you record it and play back the clip, then you just get a clip of what you play. Right. So it's the same deal. So there's uh, some latency there. There's some latency, right. but it's, you know, it's a modern, high performance, it's an RME UCX, right? So I, can, I mean, I, I don't know what I could accept, but you could wind that down to like 32 samples probably and it would be fine. Um, and the joy of, I mean, there is latency in this. Any computer-based audio system has latency, <coughs> but the thing about, certainly, um, is to do with the, with the timing I mentioned earlier. As long as the timing, as long as any latency or offset or whatever is constant, you can always adjust for it. It's when things change randomly that mm -hmm. it becomes a problem, and that's the problem with um, a lot of things based on MIDI or USB MIDI in particular, is that the timing is just all over the show, basically. Um, a, it's all over the show anyway, and B, with MIDI, um, two MIDI messages going down a single cable always happen one after the other. So you can't, there's no simultaneity in MIDI. There's no such thing as a bass drum and a snare drum hitting at the same time. It's always bubble. Um, and that will become even more clear, or I'll emphasize that even more when I come to the next thing which I want to show you, which is the ES5. Now the ES5 is another part of this kind of um, digital audio based ecosystem. Um, it's an expander for the ES3. Uh, there's a little ribbon cable behind the back. Um, and the kind of the theory behind that is that, say you've got a stereo, you've got 24 bit stereo audio, right? Um, so you've got two times 24 bits flying down the cable at 44.1 thousand times a second. Or let's say 48 because it's easier to say. So what the ES5 says is it takes those 48 bits of information and says that's not two 24-bit signals, it's 48 one-bit signals. What can we do with those? Well, for a start, we can use them as clocks or drum trees because all you need is non-off. So suddenly, rather than having eight outputs, you've got potentially a huge number of outputs, um, which, and we're not basing it, wasting any bandwidth because you're not wasting this very precise signal just to go an on-off signal. So, I have an ES5 plugged in here, and that is, or is or was, is, let me just turn this on. So what I've got set up, um, to, um, unlike the, so a lot of silent way where it's just generating an LFO or a pitch signal, there's lots of ways of doing that, and because the signal is just the signal, it's conceptually just one channel of audio in the door. Because the ES5 is doing this slightly crazy thing of totally abusing the digital audio stream to carry other information, you have to encode um, the one on the other, um, which is kind of where bits of Silent Way come in. Um, though I did write some Max MSP externals to do the same thing. But long story short, there's this plugin called the ES5 controller, which basically the job of that plugin is to take um, audio or MIDI signals inside the door and turn that into the audio which fundamentally drives the ES5. And the way I've got that set up in live at the moment is I've got a, I've got this uh, drum track, MIDI drum track in live. It's kind of set up as a drum rack in live, but the actual drum parts aren't doing anything, they're just kind of placeholders. And I'm stealing the MIDI from that to feed it to the ES5 controller. So basically what it means is I've got four tracks of um, four lanes of drum MIDI things there coming out of four <coughs> trigger outputs on the ES5. If I can remember what I plugged them into. I think it's that one. 
Yeah, so that's the world's worst drum pan. <laughs> but um, let me just find. Hang on. There we go. Oh, I could. Yeah, I haven't even plugged it into the S5. Oh, yay. That was cool. Okay, it's a terrible drum pattern, but it, it does at least reflect what's in the MIDI, right? Um, that's, you know, so you can draw in your drum parts, so they come out here as outputs. Now, the, I'm just going to expand on the point I made earlier about drums in MIDI. If that was coming through a MIDI cable, like any beat, say that that's put on the first beat of the bar here from Farmer Mass, there's a hit on each channel. On MIDI, that would be <laughs> four. Whereas, because that's going through the audio system as part of one big 48-bit flat, those four outputs are exactly simultaneous to... Um, oh, hang on, where's it going? Yeah, so like to within nanoseconds. It's like they're exactly simultaneous. So there's no weird timing variation, there's no weird flamming of bass drums against each other where... You know, I, I've measured this on, on MIDI systems where the, the jitter in the triggering of a sample is comparable to the half wavelength of the bass drum, right? So if you think you've got two bass drums doing that and then one of them goes 180 degrees out of phase, you suddenly end up with no bass drum. Mm -hmm. And it's a real thing, whereas with this, that can't happen. The other thing with MIDI is, if you trigger drums on MIDI, you're forced to send loads of information that you don't actually need. You have to send pitch and velocity, even if you don't need them. Yeah. So the interface is running slower, but you're sending stuff you don't need. Whereas you're only sending what you need, though, you're only sending gates. Exactly. So exactly one bit of information. Mm. Um, so that's that's four outputs. There's another handy part of um, Silent Way here called Silent Way Sync. And the point of this plugin is solely to generate clocks at some division of the door's tempo. Um, so I've got, you know, I've dropped another two plugins and I've now got two more outputs up here which I can use for clocks. Um, I had it packed <coughs> into a delay at some point. <coughs> Let's do that now because it might make the point. Where's that going? Right, I need a longer cable. Uh, not that one. Maybe that one. I think this one was a clock delay. Okay. Alright, bear with me. Okay, that's not in time, but let's give it a clock signal. That's five outputs from that. If you add more expanders, you can get up to the full 48 outputs, um, which is a lot. The um, to the outputs are assigned directly in the software, aren't they? Not on the ES5. That's that's okay. what I mentioned. For the ES3, where an output is basically one of the ADAT channels, it's conceptually exactly the same as routing stuff in the door. But for the ES5, you have to go through this kind of munging stage of running it through the plugins. Um, so yeah, if you've got a ton of triggers or clocks you need, especially things like the like the tip top drum modules, which have got a trigger and an accent. That's two triggers you need for two triggers you need for each um, each drum. You can very quickly run out of triggers unless you've got a lot of triggers um, if you want to sequence stuff up. Um, so I, yeah, enough about. I mean, there are other. Bits. There's an expander called the ESX8CV, <coughs> got more CVs out, um, and kind of ironically, given how much I've been banging on about MIDI and how terrible it is, is I, I do have an expander for this system which uses the sample accurate bit stream that this is based on to actually reconstruct a MIDI signal and then give you that on a 5-pin DIN output. 
Um, so you can actually have MIDI, but it's MIDI that's going through the audio system rather than MIDI going through the USB MIDI system, which means you can actually get MIDI with timing guarantees, um, which is finally, <laughs> finally, <laughs> yeah. So it's like you used to have with your Atari ST. Um, yeah. So I don't have that in the in the rack because it's huge and it's not always that easy to demo in, in a small system. But yeah, if, if you have old MIDI gear that you want to generate, that you want to drive with better timing than a USB system offers typically, then yeah, I have a solution for that as well. Um, it's not a panacea because of course there's two ends of every MIDI connection. There's the sending end and the receiving end, and sometimes the receiving end is god awful. Uh, and there's nothing I can do about that. But um, if, if, as long as the receiving end is good, then I can generate a sample accurate MIDI thing on the output. Um, the best one I've heard is the um, Akai S950, actually. Apparently, typically responds to MIDI kind of within a, two samples or so of variants, which is exceptional. So, yay, Akai. <laughs> from 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so at this point, um, I can come back to any of this at any time, but just the interest of moving things forward, I'm going to move away from... Well, I'm in danger of just repeating myself. Okay, quickly then. Um, so that all, for all of this, I've been using the RME connected to an ES3 and the various other things to do this. Now, <coughs> the, my most recent kind of release in this rate kind of slice of products is the ES8, uh, which is this one here. Now, the ES8 is basically all of this, but it is itself a USB audio interface. So you don't need a motor or an RME, you just need the thing, and you just plug it in to your computer directly. If I can remember which of them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if anyone wants one, it's the only expert sleepers thing they actually have on, on sale here today. So, yeah, you, so you just take your USB. No. You just take your, if I can get hold of it, you just take your USB cable and you plug it into the computer. Um, and uh, it just pops up in your list of audio interfaces and you select it like so, and now you're just using the ESA as your audio interface. So all the stuff I've just done, audio in and out, your CVs out, CVs in, all of that stuff, <coughs> except all I'm using is a single USB cable between the laptop and the modular, and then up and running. Um, so I won't just, it supports the ES5 as well if you want all the trigger based stuff and the MIDI based stuff. And it's just super convenient to just have those two things directly connected. Um, it's got eight outputs, it's got four inputs. If you want more inputs and outputs, it's got ADAT things itself. So you can have an <coughs> ES8 connected via ADAT to an ES3 and an ESX and up your channel count, um, which is nice. It works on Mac, it works on um, Windows, and it works <coughs> on iOS. And I have an iPad here. There it is. Right, so this is where we're going to move away from the computer. So it needs the ES3 then to expand CVs and audio, did you say, or? To expand it, yes, yeah. if you want more than the what it offers by itself. Yeah, it's the ES5 though. You can plug the ES5 into the ES5. Or you can plug the ES5 directly into the ES8 as well. There's quite Both a just by the aid that then? No, so... Sorry. No, <laughs> so the, the ES8 connects to the computer via USB, that's everything you need unless you want to expand it. You can expand it with the ES3, you can expand it with the ES6, you can expand it with the ES5. You can also hang another ES5 off the ES3. Um, and you can hang other things off the ES5, and then you can hang the ES7 off the ES6. So there's quite a lot of options. Yeah. But basically, you can e the maximum you can end up with from the ES8 expanded is 16 outputs and 12 inputs or more if you use the ES5 for gates and triggers and stuff. Yeah. And of course you can use, you can just plug another ES8 in if you want more. Um, 
So, you know, the, the, the joy of it being a USB product is you can just keep plugging them in. Um, and it being class compliant, it, it does work with iOS. Um, and in, I'm just going to, where's the camera? I just want to put my password in away from the camera. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, ES. So, what we're talking about. Okay, so this ES8 down here now, this little one, that's connected to the iPad. So, simple example. This is an application called Alm by Climatica. Um, it's a kind of audio mixing and routing environment. Um, <laughs> so you know, I can just select my ESA input in there. So let's find um, let's find something that's making some sound. Uh, maybe that one is it making sound? Is it making sound? Yeah. So I'll plug that in there. And when they like us to see some. I'm not sure what sound that's making. Maybe that would be a better one. Yeah. Um, and then I'll just take an output straight from the ES8. I've no idea how loud this is going to be. Let's turn it down here because it is a mixer after all. Okay, is that making sound? Okay, so basically the, that, all that's happening now is that the audio is coming into the iPad, running through this and going back out the ES8. So I've, I've got a fader. So for £500, plus another, <laughs> £500, I've now got a fader. <laughs> Yay. Um, but obviously it's software, right? So now you can just throw stuff at it in a crazy manner. So now I've got a delay plugin, right? Because I'm just hosting a delay or a reverb. So you can imagine you can very quickly, you know, you've got a whole, you can run whole doors in here, right? So you've, you've now you've got an iPad based environment, but with a modular interface for audio, in and out, or for CVs, because there are plenty of things that do CVs in um, iOS <coughs> as well. So for example, Audulous is a nice one. Loads. There we go. Oh dear. I made the mistake of updating this before I came out, and now I don't know where anything is. Um, okay, let's not listen to this because it's not audio. But um, so the guys at Audulous are great. They um, they have an ES8 and they use it and they like it and they use it to make interesting um, stuff. If I can remember how to drive this. So it's kind of a little graphically modular environment kind of thing and they make all kinds of patches in here but this is a thing they made especially for the ES8. They had this idea that you could make you could make patches in Audulous um, with CV inputs and CV outputs such that you could basically forget you had an iPad. So once you've loaded it up, you're just going to put this over here and just use the CV inputs and outputs like you would any other module. And this particular one is an Octature LFO, right? So you've got, it's, you can see on the LEDs, I can't think of how I'm going to patch up eight LFOs in a <coughs> short space of time. Um, maybe I should mention, all my modules have these jack sockets that light up, in case it's not clear what that is. Um, <laughs> Which often means I do a lot of demos just, just pointing at the sockets rather than actually having any audio. Um, red means it's positive, blue means it's negative. If it's brighter, it's a stronger voltage, basically. So anything that's going red and then blue and red and then blue is probably an LFO. If it's moving fast, it starts to look purple because the two colours blend together and you've got a fair bet that's audio or a very fast LFO. Or you know, It's a great way of visually debugging, if nothing else, because you say, oh, what the hell's that doing? Oh, it seems to be a gate, or a LFO, or a trigger. So that's fun. So yeah, Audulous um, is one. Um, what's another one I've got? Uh, Zmores Modular is another nice one. Um, it's, you know, these, if you're more familiar with things like Reactor, or whatever, you know, think of it as Reactor on an iPad. It's, you know, you've got things with patch cables, um, uh, can I remember how this one works? This is quite a nice one actually. I'm gonna, just going to take a moment to actually connect things up to make that do something. 
Okay, so, so what this one is, okay, so that's part of this patch. Basically, it's taking a, a clock from the modular, which is just this LFO here, if I you can speed that up. Okay, so that's my clock, it goes into the ESA, it appears here, it goes down to this clock thing, which sequences up these trigger things, which trigger these little guys in the software, which are making that drum sound, and the drums are getting mixed, and then sends this audio back out of the ESA. So it's a kind of hybrid CV audio patch there. And then there's another, there's another slice of this, which is doing, what's it doing? Well, I don't even know where that's going now. Not that one. Bear with me. Maybe it's that one. Okay, these, these things aren't synced up, so. Okay, so I've got the top going in, sequencing drums, generating audio, the audio coming out. I've also got audio going in, going through an echo effect in here, coming back out as audio. And the other thing I didn't mention is that these little sequences that are sequencing the synthetic drums, one of the triggers is coming straight out of the ESA. So if I plug that into my snap up, snare drum here, yeah. And I'm going to have to use a mixer because I've run out of output. No, wrong one. Where's that going? Have I got that? No, wrong, wrong one. I need an output. Painfully slow. Okay. Okay, so what, let's just slow that down a bit. So that's the iPad drums, and that snare is being triggered by the iPad, but it's this module here. So it, that's not <coughs> a very slick demo, but that's a, you know, it just becomes one hybrid patching environment. So that's the ESA, I could equally, I, well, I did plug that into there as well. Um, so yeah, you can you know think of that as driving stuff, or just think of this as a big slab of CPU power that you can use for reverb or echo or any other kind of munging you like, really. And it's just hanging off your modular. Um, and I think that's about the limit of what I can talk about succinctly in terms of integrating modular and computer, um, which could take me on to talking about things nothing to do with those, or we could stop there and have a talk about integrating modular or computer. Is there any, any questions? Is there anything uh, sort of about doing it in VR, so that you can mm -hmm. have VR representations of all your modular gear, um, and as a disabled user, actually, the, the, the accessibility of that? Right. So I don't have to move and I can drag everything I want to me instead of having to move along walls of stuff would be just insane and then if you've got all the access then to just turn the box over and just then start doing all your wiring just straight out in, in VR would just be immense for, for someone like myself. Yes, so, that's you know, outside that's of my scope. I, mean, I, I can I mean, mention yeah. there's um, a company called Alive in VR is it? Um, which is Ableton Live in virtual reality. Oh, really? Um, they had it down at Point Blank uh, in the summer. I think they're touring around the country at the minute trying to sort of build up some sort of presence for it because obviously you need quite a large VR system to use it. Mm. But it's basically a uh, session view in Ableton in VR, but that's just about as limited as it is. But I use session view quite a lot to control my modular um, using like a launch pad and an ES8 yeah. and some other bits. So it could probably get you halfway there, at least with playing it. Obviously, you'd have to set it up first. But yeah, I've, I've definitely, definitely heard, something from, to look up. heard from blind users, actually, who are somehow using this stuff. But I think, I think there tends to be a lot of kind of MIDI controller setup going on 
to kind of have things in a recognisable. I might have that completely wrong. I, I, I've just been emailing with these people, but yeah. um, certainly there are ways of, of setting up kind of MIDI interfaces, <coughs> which is, <coughs> as it happens, another thing I make. But um, I haven't quite got there yet. But in terms of, I don't know, that's, that's sounds interesting. It does. It's not, uh, not something like I could personally because I mean it would be great from where I'm sat mm. for, for, for all of the guys in Euro Rack to be kind of aiming or heading somewhere along that line so that you can get so much access and you can even then access all your, all your studio while you're away you know you could literally just plug straight into your home studio wherever you are mm. um, and just flipping your, your device over so if you've got patch points on the back and things that you need access to you just grab it and turn it over and you can see all the stuff on the back and you can plug it back in. Um, it would be a really interesting way, I think, to, to be able to give access to a whole range of different users and a different way of using it. Yeah. I can certainly see that would be moderately straightforward for an entirely software-based product. I think having that work with stuff that is intrinsically hardware might be quite challenging, especially like real analog stuff with anything that you want to act, a, a, access, something like access remotely, you've got to then digitise the inputs and outputs, which is arguably completely taking away the whole point of it being analog in the first place. Mm. But something like VCB RAP, for example, which is possibly something I should mention, um, there are software modulars nowadays, like I've, I've talked about kind of Max MSP and things like that, and Swarms and Cordula. With things like VCV Rack, there are full on, like here is this, but in software systems, which are, are kind of interesting. Using your product would be like perfect. To like exactly. Um, and there, there's a, um, as a YouTube channel, a guy called Loopop um, made a very nice video demonstrating exactly this, um, which if I have a minute later, I'll find the video. So he, and he made, they did the video really nicely. Somehow he, he had, he'd obviously edited the video quite carefully, and he had um, his, Part of the screen was his physical modular, and then he had obviously a screen capture of his virtual mm -hmm. modular. But he's, in the video, he'd arranged it to be one row of his hardware modular. So yes, as far, no. when you first looked at it, you thought well, you didn't think he actually had any software in the talk. And you were saying it was like, wait, could you just like try yeah. certain modules and before that? And that? So that's yeah. And the the ES8 works particularly nicely in VCV Rack because there's you can just kind of drop in a module in VCB Rack and tell it's, it's an ESA and then you have these patch points between the software and the hardware. Um, yeah, it, it's worth a look if you're interested in that stuff. And yeah, he touts that as a, a useful in its own right. In the same way as I was talking about Silent Way in the beginning, it, it's a great way to see like, do I really like this module? Well, let's just try a software version of it and see if I get on with that. And then if I hate it, then I won't go and buy it. But if I buy it, it'll probably be better if in the hardware. Maybe. It might be too. Well, you could load 20 <laughs> copies of it, is that um, So there's, there's things to be said for both. I, I personally like analog stuff. Um, I like digital stuff that is, because a lot of these modules aren't analog, right? I mean, really, these are old school stuff, but certainly all my things, by their nature of digital audio things, they're digital, the disc thing which I'll waffle about later is, is digital, that's digital, loads of modules that are really popular nowadays are actually digital, but the interface is, is analog, which is what makes it fun, um, and I, I would never, I, I, you know, I used to, I went through a phase of making all my music in the box, and I've kind of, I do it in both, and I think there's a happy medium, but everybody, everybody has their own way, sorry I'm philosophizing now. <laughs> Give me one beer. Um, <laughs> anything else on hardware, modular software integration before I just start? Is there any way of getting like, um, like a, an audio <coughs> pulse to become a clock for your modular? Yes. System? Well, just pure audio, just like yeah. a. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some if you if you stick a nice, nice little, nice loud kick drum through a lot of things that they're expecting a trigger, that will just work. It certainly works with my Juno 6. Um, just give it a kick drum and it triggers the ar arpeggiator. Um, Is there any way to yeah. get it into silent way? Does that listen to uh, things like that? Um, no, silent, everything I've done, 
I think kind of received wisdom is that computers are very good at generating control. They're very bad at following control. Um, certainly not wanting, I'm on camera here, so I don't want to say too many rude things about too many people, but live, live might be great now, but live is famously not that good at following me. Okay. Um, well, so historically, I'm sure it's good now. I mean, they did a lot of work with that Ableton Link stuff, which is, seems to work pretty well. Um, but in terms of sitting there and generating a clock, it's great. Um, so yeah, having having the modular is is the kind of tempo clock. Off, often doesn't work as well. If you did want to try it, a um, drummer actually made a plugin um, a while ago. I think it was someone. Well, he may not have been a drummer, but it was working with drummers. And it was his old like, PhD paper. Can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's a Maxwell plugin you can get off the Ableton website, and it analyzes rhythms and syncs Ableton's clock. And is that the James Holden thing, the like humanizer thing? No. Um, there's a video with Adam Beatty from Trap Tigers or something using it. But um, yeah, it's a device you can get off Ableton's website, released through their website. The Max. Yeah, yeah. So it's a Max device and it analyzes incoming audio and syncs Ableton's tempo with it. If it can follow a drummer, it can yeah, likely, yeah. sure as hell, follow a simple kick. Yeah. I've tried using yeah. it with other musicians to varying rates of success depending how sloppy or... I guess it also depends as to what you're... When, well, when I think of sync, I tend to think in terms of exactly repeatable exact sync, such that you can do multi-pass recordings and everything lines up. If all you want is to do a gig and have the computer play something that everybody considers to sound pretty much in time, then yeah, that's probably a lot better. Um, yeah. You know, because you, you can get away with murder live. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it depends what music you're making as well. If, if you're making kind of big evolving textures, then it doesn't maybe matter quite so much as if you're making very tightly quantized techno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. But yeah, computer as master is certainly an, an easy proposition. One side note, just. Um Charles hadn't quite mentioned it. I find the integration really good. It allows you to get hands on with all your stuff, but then you can, maybe in a slightly boring way, almost use a lot of it like a VST. I mean, going somewhere towards what would be possible with a um, audio reactive, visual reactive setup and stuff. But anything that has a CV input in a module, you can control. <laughs> Run a load of audio, for instance, run a load of audio through a whole load of different effects, have fun with your hands, but then CV everything and actually finally automate things as you would more with a VST one when you want to lay something down. <coughs> and also with how many ins and outs you've got on the ES8 or with extensions, you can almost have an entire rack of what would have been very big hardware reverb delays, blah blah blah. You can have spring reverbs, all the possible nice analog modules, tube distortions, whatever, types of saturation, filters, run them all in and out individually and almost have a kind of relatively traditional studio effects rack set up, but where you can see the automate everything almost like it's a plug-in, and then pull it all out and actually have fun and get hands-on again and switch between the two actually relatively quickly, which is one really good thing about them. Need to get you on my marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I've I've personally found from using because we we keep an ES8 in the shop rack um, at all times, um, and I found from having to do kind of try and try and avoid doing the whole kind of left to right door composition of things. So it's a lot of live takes. So and there's elements in that that you want to be the same every time. So that's just basically like an Ableton sequence. And you can just run that out, and it will play the same thing every time, as opposed to I don't know if you know anyone is kind of experienced using like a uh, like a linear sequencer or like a Eurorack sequencer, where it's all very slider based, and trying to get back to your original sequence from what you end up with is hell. So you just put them all in your Ableton project, set them to scroll down, and then you can do four, five, thirty takes of the same thing. Yeah. And then you can control the parameters on the front, but still have all of the backing is rigid all the time. And also for input, so you can actually multi-track modular. 
yeah. and then mix stuff afterwards because yeah. everyone knows there's that one bit when you rag the resonance a little bit too hard mm -hmm. and then it goes really square for a tiny bit mm -hmm. and then you got to kind of do the horrible automation thing and it's just not mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah, I'm running out like, yeah so because I've only just recently dipped my toes into modular <coughs> and it's allowed me to keep modular as an extension of the computer and that's been perfect for my like, kind of entry into the modular world by yeah, being able to automate parameters on hardware. It's just fantastic for that. It's like a perfect bridge yeah. into this kind of world from working entirely in the box. Just, yeah, really great. We've all gathered here to tell you how good you are. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate this. So yeah, I mean, that, I, I guess that it mirrors my, that's why I did this stuff, right? It's because I wanted to use it fundamentally. Um, so that's how I've worked on and off. Now I have also done stuff where I've just got a modular case and um, that's also fun. It's nice sometimes just to turn the computer off and, and play. So I, I do have a couple other modules I'd be very glad to tell you about if anybody's this got day. more time. <laughs> um, can you do anything like funky sort of rerouting it to itself? You know yeah, well, that's the joy of cables, right? You can plug a cable in anywhere. So well, I'm not quite sure. I mean, to what end, though? I mean, <laughs> what should I try and do? Plug you, you, yeah, you, you know, it's it's a module. Like using your software to kind of do funky, weird things that you won't be able to. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. I mean, at the end of the day, there are. The software can do a lot of stuff, but as I've just said, a lot of the modules are basically just software hiding behind a matter panel, and they can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's as convenient or flexible um, is up for grabs, really. Um, software on a computer is extremely flexible. Software running on hardware is typically, I don't want to generalize, but it's probably running faster. I mean, any proper DSP is, you know, it's processing every audio sample as it comes in, whereas on a computer it's batching it up into blocks of samples, so maybe you're not. I don't know, but it, it's all becoming a bit of a blur, what's hardware and what's software, to be honest. Um, yeah, and it's, once you put a control surface on the computer, so the computer has a physical interface to it as well, then it's even more blurry. Uh, but there's still something about staring at a screen which is either good discipline or horror, depending on how you're feeling on that, that day. Um, we can come back. Let, let, let's just, let me just waffle about some other things, mm -hmm. if I may. Um, apart from all this computer interfacey stuff, I have, I guess, three things, but I don't really want to talk much about one of them. I have, I have the FH1, which is... A MIDI interface, ironically, having talked for ages about how MIDI is terrible. The great thing about MIDI is that you can pick up a MIDI controller for really not very much money. And they're really good. And they're really useful. Um, and you can plug, if you've got the right interface, like the Expert Sleepers FH1, you can plug one of these in and suddenly you've got all these faders and knobs and more importantly the faders and knobs are here and they're not underneath all these cables. Mm -hmm. Uh, or you've got a keyboard, and then you can like play tunes and stuff. So I, I'm not even going to plug that in and demo it. Suffice to say, it's there if you just want to plug MIDI controllers into your modular and not have a computer anywhere in sight. It's really handy for that, mm -hmm. um, and it does a whole bunch of stuff, um, from simple outputting a fader as a CV to polyphonic MIDI to CV conversion, um, and other stuff. You can plug a, um, a PlayStation 4 pad into it as well and kind of get expressive with that. Um, so that's quite handy. Um, but the two, two kind of completely non-computer based fun things I do, um, I do this thing called the Disting. Um, I've got seven of those here. Um, Probably you still not enough. <laughs> still not enough. <laughs> just, just for reference, this is, this is my gigging case I've got here, I've got on modular grid. Uh, there's eight distings in that. Um, they just, it does a whole lot of stuff. Um, it, it started a few years ago now. The original disting um, did 16 different things. 
Um, it basically had one knob to choose which thing it did, and another knob to control something, and three inputs and two outputs. <coughs> and it was kind of fun. Um, and the latest one is the Disc Team Mark IV, which the last count does like 70 odd different things, I think. Um, with a lot more control than the Mark I ever had. Um, it does kind of basic CV stuff, like really basic stuff like um, CV adder and multiplier. Um, and it does has some VCOs and it has some LFOs and it has some kind of pseudo random CV generators and trigger generators and Euclidean pattern generators. But because under the hood it's kind of embracing this whole, well, audio is just a CV really and CV is just an audio really kind of mentality. It does a lot of audio stuff like that delay I patched in just a minute ago. That was this thing being an echo, but a clockable echo in a modular. And it does reverbs and it does phases and choruses and it does um, other tape delay. Um, and it's also got a micro SD card on it, um, which means it will play back samples or MIDI files. Um, and it can record audio as well onto the SD card. In fact, in my live case there, that little this thing on the end, right next to the output module, is permanently in record mode. So I can just record my gig as I play it, right there in the module, which is handy. So um, I don't propose to run through all 70 algorithms <laughs> just now. I mean, I'll, you've heard a couple of them already. I can, I can bring them back so you can like, maybe pay attention to what it is a little bit more. Um, this is one of the audio playback modes. Um, so that's an audio playback mode that goes backwards and forwards with very speed. Um, there's a couple different ones, it's basically depending on what you want to CV control, because there's only three inputs. So you've got like a trigger and a pitch control, or maybe if you don't want a pitch control, you've got an input for where you want the stamp to start when you re-trigger it or maybe you want to control what sample's playing by CV, um, which can get quite interesting. Uh, in which case, it's quite similar to the radio music, if you ever used the radio music. What's that doing now? Seems to have gone to sleep. Yeah. So, you know, you stick an LFO on that and you're in business, really. Um, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Sorry. In that, I've that, normally there's a crossfade that stops it clicking. I've turned it off in that one because I wanted the changes to be really snappy, but unfortunately that means it's clicking a little bit. But um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different ways of playing back uh, audio. There's one of them's got um, oh, there's one with a um, volt per octave pitch control, so you can actually play pitch sample melodies on it. Um, there's one. Uh, there's one where you can tell it how many clocks are in a loop and then you give it a clock and it will play back your sample synced up to that incoming clock and so on and so forth. Um, and it's stereo, which a lot of sample playback modules aren't. Um, and there's a mode where it uses the two outputs for two different samples if you want to play two different drums. Um, so lots of fun there with audio playback. Uh, also using the SD card, mm -hmm. um, it's got a wavetable VCO. Now I forget if this card has got, yes it does, okay, so this is where we do need an LFO, let's use that one. There we go, my wavetable sounds. So I mean, you know what a wavetable does, but that's... It sits there and is a wavetable VCO at the flick of a switch. Um, lots of LFO, I use it for LFOs a lot actually. Um, there's a few different LFO modes, including one which I haven't actually released yet, which is a, it does that, um, it's called a delayed VCO, but LFO, but it's not delayed at all. It's just what it used to be called on the old Juno 6. So it's a LFO that kind of fades up at the start of every note. So there's a mode to do that now. Mm -hmm. Um, 
which otherwise takes like three different modules to patch together to get this relatively simple thing. Mm -hmm. It's quite useful. Um, the um, Euclidean pattern generators may be worth a quick demo. Where's that? H5. Let's get my clock. Maybe not quite that fast. No, I don't know what's why anymore. Do you find that even though you design the disk thing, especially now it's the Mark IV and it's got that many algorithms in it, that you still forget which one's which? Um, well, I often, certainly in that live case, I, I kind of, you, I just tend to leave it, like one disk thing becomes the LFO for a week. And then once you know that's the LFO, you don't necessarily have to keep reminding yourself how an LFO works, right? So you just, um, yeah, it's not that bad, really. I mean, it sounds overwhelming, but if you just decide, oh, today I need an LFO, I'll punch in the LFO, and then once you've got the LFO there, I mean, it's only got three inputs, so it's not that many different things to remember. Um, so I, I don't find it to be a problem. Um, certainly not once you've practiced um, a setup or, you know, set something up and then got it straight in your head. I'm just trying to set up this dual Euclidean thing. Where's that going? Not there. Yeah. You got a kick drum? I don't know what I'm listening to now. Why is that not firing? I think it's just because this bass drum is inaudible. Let's try the other one. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I don't know if you're aware of the kind of concept of Euclidean patterns generally. It's, there's a mathematical algorithm for most evenly distributing a number of steps, a number of pulses <coughs> and a number of steps. So say you have 16 steps in the sequence and you say I want five steps distributed within that 16 step sequence. There's a way of, there's an algorithm for determining where they go with the largest average space between them. And it turns out that these patterns are fundamental to lots of kind of African and other rhythms where you kind of divide a number of steps into a number of pulses and have the same thing going. So basically what this mode on the disting does, it takes in a clock and then there's a one on a knob and another on a parameter for choosing the pulses that you want to split that into. And it gives you two trigger outputs, which I'm using for those two drums. There. So you do a pitch, like, a, you could, like, like an arpeggiator kind of thing, like a Euclidean rhythm, do you know what I mean? Mm, maybe, okay. but I'm not sure. Right. What? So you don't, yeah, I mean, you have to trigger drums with it, I guess is yeah, one yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so sometimes what I've done, I was saying earlier, um, I, I had a whole, in fact, in this particular setup I was using the other day, this, this thing was dedicated as a dual Euclidean generator, and that was triggering most other things. So, say for example, if you, if you, let's say you take, I'm just trying to talk and think of a coherent demo at the same time. If, if you set it up to make five pulses in a 16 part, rhythm and then set a sequencer to be a five-step sequencer, then you've got this kind of nice five-step rhythm going. Mm. Um, but not kind of hard to explain without actually doing that. Mm. Let's do, well, I could do that very quickly. Let's set up a, let's set up a CV. I've got a four-step sequencer, that's the trouble. <laughs> but it'll make the point. Um, Let's, so rather than doing that one, let's take that one into there. Let's take that one into here. And then that's going into here. Okay, so it's not quantized, so you'll have to ignore the kind of pitching. And then. So that, if I, hang on, it's a 16 step sequence, so if I put them both down to, no, not that one. 
So now they're both just going once every 16, right? And if I put that one up to... Sorry. So now every 16 I've got one, one drum and two notes. Or if I could go for four drums and two notes, which is pretty dull, but if you put them to odd numbers, then I've now got five drums and three notes. You can have a lot of fun with that, especially when you can consider that you can um, you can CV the the thing that controls how many pulses there are in every repeat. You can put a CV on, so if you start sequencing that up, then you can get some very ve interesting varying kind of tempos. In fact, why don't we do that? If I can find a cable. Maybe the LFO's got a little bit too much range there, but no, not that one. No, not that one. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, um, that's Euclidean rhythms. Um, it does um, kind of pseudo-random sequence generation as well, which is a particularly easy one to demo, which is why I'm mentioning it, if I can remember where that one is. Uh, uh, six, in fact, this one's already set to do it. So if I, um, if I take my clock into that one instead, take my pitch from that one into here, take my gate, where's my gate? Where is my gate? Uh, and I still can't hear anything. I can't hear anything. I turn it down. Okay. So. Okay. So at the moment, that's just generating a random pattern, right? But the joy of this is a you can quantize it in pitch. So let's. Now it's just using a triad, or now it's just doing octaves and fifths, which is but the joy of the this is kind of using the shift register random mode um, of sequence generation, which means you can kind of have a controllable randomness for completely random to kind of slightly less random to completely locked, and now it's just playing the same thing over and again. So this is very similar to the Turing machine if you've ever played with one of those. So this is kind of a fun way of just mucking about until you get a sequence that you like, really. Let's randomly, let's choose, somebody shout out an algorithm. How about reverb? Yeah. <laughs> let's not have that. Um, I don't know even what that was. Where's that? Right, first reverb. Um, okay. Which cables? Uh, Sorry. Where's that one going? No, not that one. Let's try that one. Is that open source so you can write your own stuff for it? Ah. The disc, yeah, um, the it's not open source, but it is open in as much as, um, and not for the Mark IV yet, but for the Mark III and the Mark II. Um, I've, there's some code on GitHub, which is a kind of hello world. 
which basically is, is gets the thing up and running and says put DSP here. <coughs> and then you can write your own code for it. Um, and people have done that. Um, I haven't done that yet for the for the Mark IV, um, through lack of time as much as anything, but I, I do intend to do it. So yeah, it, it, underneath it's basically a microcontroller and an audio coder. So you can just write write code and have it do stuff, which is basically how I have fun. It's like Friday afternoon, right? We've done some real work. Let's put another mode into the disk thing, um, and it's good fun because you know all the heavy lifting's done, all the kind of hard stuff. You just have to kind of put in your stuff that makes sound, um, and it's good fun. So what do you write that in? C. C. Reverb stereo, isn't it? So let's. Um with a reverb really, you know? That's a chorus. And long chorus emulation. I forget what the, there's a parameter on that, what does that do? The original, the original 16 are the top two yeah. rows, and the, my favourite of those is the is was the clockable delay. Actually, um, that's lots of feedback. So ideally, what we would like now is a clock. What's clocking that? That, and then set the multiply. I love delays, basically. Yeah. And that's that's a ping pong for it. So it's I mean, that just sounds way better. Um, so yeah, it does a whole load of stuff. There's a load of um, useful um, envelope generators as well. Um, it's it's a good one to have in a small system because a it's there's a lot of functionality in a small space, but it also Maybe you think, oh, do I want a random CV generator in my modular? Let's see if how it is. And then if you found you enjoy it, then you can maybe go out and buy a random CV, CV generator that takes up 20 HP rather than four. Um, it, it's a good, it's a good test bed, but it's genuinely useful in its own right, um, and it's not, it's not dear. Um, and never in stock. It's also never in stock, but <laughs> there's, there's a reason for that. It's, it's not because it does 70 case. things in 4 HP. It's, it, it, it's not in stock because people want to buy it, um, yeah. which is it's nice. So cheers to that. <laughs> um, so anything, any one of those things that you'd like me to demo, I will come back to. But before everybody loses the will to live, um, I want to mention this other module here, currently buried underneath a pile of patch cables called the General CV. Um, which is my most recent effort. Um, now I'm just gonna just gonna tidy up some of these cables because I'm finding it hard to figure out what's going on. And I'm just gonna plug. So I'm just gonna plug the loud the speakers directly into the stereo output of the general CV. So anything you hear for the next few minutes is straight out of this module. Okay, nothing else. Um, so the general CV is this, 
what it is, is the unholy wedlock of a general MIDI synthesizer chip and a CV to MIDI converter. So the inputs are all CVs and there's knobs and a wee screen. Um, and what comes out is all audio, really. So it's just purely a way of making sounds. Now, it, it can be it can be as plain and uninspiring as you think general MIDI would be, um, which is maybe not the place to start, but I just want to kind of make the point that if you just put, um, turn up. There we go. So there's a general MIDI piano sound. And at this point, everybody says, can it do the orchestral hit? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, if I can find it. It's here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so it does do the orchestral hit, but you don't necessarily want to leave it doing that all day. The thing it, I mean, I don't know how long to leave it doing that, to be honest. But let's, um, let's just plug that back into here. And let's take our pitch. No, not that one, that one. That sounds like Big Ben there, there isn't it? Okay. Sounding more interesting, and it's got built-in um, built effects, which is starting to sound a bit more interesting. Um, unison detune. territory into this slightly more interesting world and especially if you <coughs> stick that through your favorite Eurorack fuzz distortion thing you can have a lot of fun even with something as simple as just using it basically as a single note source but the joy of this is that the, it, I've put some work into it so that you don't just have to trigger a note and it plays a note there are, there are many more ways of using it so, for example, um, the thing it was doing when you came in. Uh, chord mode. So this is where you give it a CV and it gives you a whole chord. And it can give you a chord with five layered sounds spread across the stereo spectrum with effects. And it's 32 note polyphonic, you know, so. <laughs> you can very rapidly get into this big world of sound. And if I just put that, slow that down. CV inputs for the chord shape, for the pitch it's based on, for the inversion of the chord, all that stuff to make, you know, this is like, again, not a very Euro-Racky sound, it's a huge wall of chord. Um, it's useful for that. There's a, um, a ba -ba -bum. there's a kind of related mode to that, which is an arpeggiator, which it, where it plays that, but arpeggiating it. Um, let me... There's a couple, let me see if I've got any presets saved, because if I have, that'll save me some setup. I 
don't know what that is. I'm very bad at very bad at naming presets. I get very bored after about the fourth character. That's another chord. Right, let's just go back to basics. Um, yeah. Okay, so another mode it has is um, kind of reset or Shepard tone generator mode. So a reset tone is one of these. Again, you've got loads of CV inputs over that to kind of and make it. That's it all one, one device, that's it? That's yeah, it. yeah, everything, all I've got is stereo out of the module, stereo into the speakers. Okay. So that's all you're hearing. So, again, LFO is just bring everything to life, if I can find an output. Um, and you don't have to have it with that kind of... That's Shepard Tones. The other opposite, the other one is, um, no, not that one. Not that one. Oh, that's down. Uh, there we go. So this is the version where you've got discrete sounds. And that's a, that's a wee bit fast, so. But that's clockable, right? So if you want to have that in the context of a modular patch, you might want to. Uh, where's it gone? No, not that one. Is it that one? There we go. So that's fairly. It's just going down the way, but you can also put a, a, a scale on that. Sounds lovely on a pentatonic. being a general MIDI thing is that it plays general MIDI files. Um, let's do, oh no, before, no, I'll, I'll end on that because it's kind of more amusing. Um, granular. So this is a mode I mean, I guess you're vaguely familiar with granular synthesis, where you take tiny chunks of sound and synthesize something from them. This is kind of takes that approach, but rather than taking chunks of sound, it's just spewing lots of notes at the general MIDI chip. So you end up with this kind of um, kind of textural thing going on. Um, Especially when you start. Not, not that one. Got a bit of pitch motion. And again, that through a bit of distortion sounds kind of threatening. Um, 
Right, general MIDI file playing. Where's it going? Ooh. Oh, um, there's, I'm not going to demo them now. There's modes that let you access the, the drums on the general MIDI chip, and there's one mode that basically you have nine drum intruders, so you can set up the full drum kit and trigger it. Um, let's give it a clock. Not that one. Not that one. Is it that one? Sorry. I've forgotten how to use my own thing here. No, don't do that. What are you doing? There we go. Okay, so that's a, that's just the general MIDI drum loop I've downloaded from the net, right? But it's clocked to the modular. I can change the tempo from the LFO. And I can sequence up different different drum loops. And you could do that from a CV, right? So if I had a keyboard connected to a CV, I can be playing my loops and spinning between them, which is quite useful. In any kind of MIDI file you want to create in your door, like live or whatever, and pop on the SD card, you can put it in here and play it. So any kind of riffs or anything like that you want to have as part of a performance, you can put in there, it doesn't have to be a rhythm. But you can also just um, download general MIDI files off the internet. So that's all, all that synthesis power is there, right? All of this polyphonic, multi timbre drums, reverb, everything, it's all in there, if only together. So my job is, the module designer, is to make it so that though there are algorithms that turn CVs into MIDI to harness all this power that's there. And you don't have to play this song, but it just gives you an idea. <laughs> I mean, the, these files back in the day, people put so much effort into these general <laughs> MIDI tracks. Um, they sound great. There's real attention to detail. So I will do that. You may or may not want to do it, but you can create MIDI files, right? So you can, if you want to create some big abstract masterpiece and spin it in from a card, you can, you can totally do that. How do you get the MIDI files? There's a micro SD card oh, just okay. here. Um, yeah. Um, I'm losing the will to speak. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Or do you want to break out into slightly less formal standing talking mode? Um, when's the uh, distinct? Um, I mean, uh, when they're coming back into the stock, you should, should be smart, should be early next week. Cool. Yeah. There's uh, the. I believe the, the metal work arrived, and that's always the last stage, bolting the front panels off. Fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, should be back in the very soon. When the general CV is in chord mode, what control do you have? So you've got the root note, but then are there other control boxes? Yeah, so you've got... Well, I guess I should... Um, all of the algorithms have between, like, 5 and 40 different parameters. Okay which you can access through the knobs, but you've got complete control over how, over which parameters are matched to the CVs. So by default, there's some mapping that it loads up with, but you can change that. So if there's something you particularly want for CV, you can. But by default on chord mode, you've got the, the root note, the inversion, the key, and the kind of, <coughs> the shape of the chord. So Inversion is obviously which is the root note. The shape is like, is it a triad, is it got a fourth, or is it just an yeah, octave and a fifth? Or, and then the key as well. Um, so the key, how is that different to the root note? Is that well, so if, if you give it a D in the key of C, it's going to play a D and F and an A. Yeah. But if you're in the key of D, that would be probably give you a D and F sharp. Oh. Yeah? So, so I mean, 
brings the chords back to the key. Yeah. Just so it just determines which yeah. which twelve which seven notes you have to work with. <coughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I think. Yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. It really kind of has to my music theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, sure there are people who will take issue with my terminology. Um, but that's that's what it does. Yeah. And same same with the arpeggiator. It's the rather than playing them all at once, it arpeggiates them up and down and backwards and forth and with a clock multiplier divider if you want to. And can that arpeggiated CV be sent back out? No, it doesn't have any CV out. Oh, so yeah. it's audio. Um, but I mean, the other thing I didn't mention is that the disting and the general CV um, have a, an expansion header on the back for actual MIDI as well. So th there's this little expansion breakout thing here, uh, which you can buy or you can DIY it. So you can just feed MIDI straight into the general CV, and it goes straight into the Philips mm -hmm. chip. Um, and the disting you can control over MIDI, or you can play. Um, yeah, there are various ways of controlling the disting through MIDI. It has a plain old MIDI to CV converter in there as well. It does has a CV to MIDI mode, um, and the disting. Without that, the disting will play a MIDI file from the SD card, but rather than playing it out as audio, it plays it out of the CV gate pattern. Mm. So you can, if you sketch a little riff, say in live, and then drag that out as a MIDI pattern, you can put that into the disting, and then you've got a looping CV gate pattern coming out of the disting, um, which again is another way of like scripting up some elements you might use in a performance, maybe, or mash about with. Um, Cool. With the um, with the general CV, yeah. was there a point where you sat down and played a keyboard with general MIDI and went, shit, this really needs to exist in the Euro Rack world? No, it was when I realised I just had I was browsing a catalogue of integrated circuits like you do, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I saw I just, I hadn't realised how much power you could get in one of these chips just straight off the shelf. I, I didn't know if anybody still made them, I just hadn't given it any thought. And then as soon as I saw it, I just thought, oh, I've got to put that in a module now. <laughs> <laughs> How can I not? Um, yeah, and I just, it kind of grew, really. And then it was like, well, well, yeah, you could just play the basic sounds, but what else can you do? Um, Basically, w with a powerful synthesizer and a whole bunch of CV inputs, what, what can you do? So, the chord was an obvious one. And also, like, what can you do that isn't necessarily already available? So, there aren't that many modules that play, play chords. There are some, but not with a flexible palette of sound, necessarily. Usually, um, they're pretty big as well. They can be pretty big. Um, the another mode this has... Uh, uh, sorry, just a minute. Uh, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? Oh yeah, um, like additive mode. I gave it an additive mode where basically it, you know, additive synthesis, right? You take the the different partials of a sound and blend them together to get a different sound. Um, and it turns out that one of the general MIDI sounds is pretty much a sine wave and there's 16 MIDI channels and they've each got volumes so if you have each MIDI channel playing a sine wave at the right frequency and you pitch bend them to exactly the right frequency and then move the channel volumes up and down you've got an additive synthesizer. So I did that. Um, which again, it... Let me just make it not sound like that. Dynamic timbre, 
going on. Um, happening there is that every time it gets a new note rather than completely switching all 15 partials at the same time it's stepping them one at a time so you've kind of got these notes that are blending together through the harmonic spectrum if that makes any sense um, Of course, it doesn't have to be the sine wave sound, you could have any other thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting Hoover kind of sound. Um, oh, yeah. Well, anyway, you kind of get the idea, maybe. So what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why did I do it? Because I thought of the idea and I couldn't not do it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Makes sense. Good question. I'll quickly ramble about two other things that um, I wasn't really thinking about before the expert sleeper stuff. One of which I was mentioned was um, recording CV. So you can record stuff into Ableton quite quickly. Um, yeah, one way is obviously sequences with pitches, but if you take in an LFO or something, one thing I hadn't thought about before was but yeah, processing LFOs with distortions or delays to change the shape. Or even with Ableton you can record in a delay and then use like time stretching algorithms to stretch them longer and you actually get some interesting artifacts into the shape by using the algorithms and certain ones like texture or something effectively almost become granular delay things over C V. Then certain kind of distortions that are like wave shapers or effectively like wave tables can shape the CV in interesting, interesting ways as well. And using something like session mode you could record say eight different interesting modulation shapes, lay them out on a launch pad and you've effectively got a way to trigger say eight channels of LFOs with different shapes all on a push button kind of interface without having to spend £800 on eight LFOs. And similarly one of the good things with Max for Live is because you can uh, control control services really in depth if you use something like the launch control XL controller there that's like eight faders and three dials or something. You can quickly build an interface that's say eight LFOs. You've got a fader that's maybe like an attenuverter. You could also have like the rate, the phase and the shape. Send them all out of the eight channels of an ES8 or ES3 and again you've got kind of one interface that just looks almost like a module, it'll give you eight LFOs really flexibly, and again, yeah, it's not 800 pounds, it's 100 quid, as long as you've got an ESA already. Um, those are two of the other things I've found personally really fun to kind of mess around with that I couldn't have done before. Cool. Yes. Cool. Can okay, go on. No, I noticed that the numbering on the ES8 is like 1 to 4 and 1 to 8. Are they, yes. Can you assign anything to any of those? Or well, is there th any these are inputs and these are outputs. Oh, okay, yeah, these yeah, are yeah inputs, that's these what are I wanted to know, yeah. But beyond that, they're all the same. Yeah, yeah. So any output can be any audio or CV. Yeah. Any input can be any audio or CV. But yeah, I didn't audio. realise, um, it's like with, um, which one was it? Um, ES3, um, was it? ES3, they're all outputs. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay, they're all outputs. Actually. Yeah. Okay. We'll look on a day where you can't fit any more algorithms on the disk in. Yes. <laughs> What's that up a little bit? We get close to it. I'm, yeah, there's, you know, there are ways I can squash down what's already in there. But it's not full yet. Because it, 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 it definitely, I, I've got the Mark IV as well as the Mark III, and I remember when I bought the Mark III, it was literally every couple of weeks, it was just like, I've got a new module. Like, literally, I'd, I'd go away for a week and come back and be like, 
oh, okay, I've, I've got a bunch of new things. So it was like, it keeps giving, it truly was. Mm. So yeah, th there's more to come, that's brilliant. There is, there is <laughs> yes, there's more, like, I'm sitting on a software release that is ready, but I, I haven't got time to do it because I'm working on something else for Superboost. Um, but as soon as, after Superboost, yeah, there's another two or three algorithms. Oh. Coming out. Yeah, is there anything you can say about Superboost at the moment? No. Andrew, is there anything? <laughs> <laughs> I'll I've be already, there. I've already tried. Yeah. I'll, I'll be there. I, okay. And are you, go, are you going to well, you, are you going to release? Is it new modules or new I, software? I've got or? a new module for Superboost. Okay. It is not a new disk. Okay. It's not a new disk thing. Then. I'll be categorical about that. It's okay. not a new disk. Yeah. But that's going to be new, just a new module. A new, a new module. Um, actually, kind of two, but one's just a kit. Um, yeah, we all happy, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, thank you very much for coming down again today. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, thank you.